Well, I'm he uh, here not really to talk about the uh, capacity in which I work at, at AMV, although there might be a few crossover points. Uh, I'm here as uh, a, the co-chair of the uh, professional development group at the IPA to talk to you about talent and the link between talent and commercial success. Uh, I'm particularly focusing on some research that's been done by the IPA. Uh, and I need a clicker here, don't I? <coughs> Um, uh, I also got a rather random collection of uh, um, shop windows to share with you. Uh, having committed to this uh, um, uh, speech title uh, a few weeks ago, I found that most human life is to be found in a shop window in some shape or form. Uh, and so I've uh, hopefully got some appropriate analogies to uh, liven up some, uh, uh, some, some research data. Um, and uh, if you, uh, the one thing I found that you couldn't find in a shop window actually is a dog. Um, uh, apparently, the animal rights activists have got control of that one. Uh, but uh, in the hope that I can um, uh, entice you with uh, prospects of lunch ahead, here's the hummingbird shop window uh, to accompany my agenda. Uh, well, I'm going to be talking to you about a brief introduction to the work of the IPA in professional development. Um, I'm going to cross-reference uh, the Talent Adaptathon, which was one of the events that uh, took place last year, where we drilled down into this issue in some detail. Uh, and then the main event is the numbers, uh, particularly for this audience. Uh, so I've got some reassuring graphs and charts there for you, talking about uh, the link between um, uh, investment in uh, training and commercial success. I think you can probably expect where I'm going to come out in terms of a conclusion. Uh, but there's plenty of evidence here to back it up. Uh, and then we've got some real-life examples, uh, some case studies of uh, how different types of agencies of different sizes have tackled this issue. Um, which I'll take you through towards the end. Um, okay, so uh, who knew that there'd be that as a shop window, but uh, it seemed to work quite well for professional development. Um, so I'm going to introduce you briefly to the professional development group at, at IPA. Um, it, is what, uh, it represents, I think, one of the three main pillars of activity that the IPA is moving towards in its new strategy, the talent pillar. There are other groups that uh, feed into that, but increasingly uh, those activities are all being brought together under the... Uh, auspices of the professional development group uh, and we are particularly focused on training and continuous professional development so CPD for those of you not familiar uh, with the term uh, we've been running courses for uh, Patrick Mills the uh, director tells me actually about 45 years um, is that right Patrick yep. uh, but um, anyway seriously for about 15 uh, and actually there's been 13,000 certificates but we've been accelerating a lot in the last 15 years um, so, uh, and there's some of the members of the, of the group. You might recognize someone there from uh, one of your agencies or people that you know. Uh, and this is the in-house team. I'm putting up these uh, faces up there deliberately. So one of the purposes of this uh, session is to try and get a better dialogue going between the talent team and the commercial team. Uh, so these are the people who run all of the training programs. They do an amazing job under Patrick's um, leadership. Uh, and some of them are represented here today, so please do uh, chat to them afterwards um, if you want to know more about IPA's training programme. Uh, you may also be familiar with this uh, diagram, which I don't propose to uh, kind of uh, run through in detail, but this is essentially the IPA's uh, model that it's developed for training programmes. It's a much simpler model than it uh, used to have. Uh, there are four main categories which actually uh, link in quite well to the, um, uh, to the IPA uh, uh, strategy pillars. You'll notice one of them is commercial. Uh, there's one also around people, and then brands and strategy and creativity is much more in the offer and effectiveness uh, territory. And uh, there's the uh, model works in three layers. So you've got foundation at the middle, uh, sort of uh, uh, intermediate, and then advanced, uh, which is the blue level. And um, uh, here are some of the uh, courses that the IPA runs. Uh, the colour codes uh, indicate which of the levels that they're uh, attached to. Uh, and increasingly, they contain uh, commercial, legal, regulatory uh, requirements uh, to make sure that um, uh, people who go through this training uh, are on point, on message, and connected uh, with a commercial agenda. Um, uh, the IPA CPD activity, uh, flagged on the left, and also there is a one-to-one -one mentoring programme which connects up uh, senior people and junior people for mutually beneficial um, kind of mentoring programs. Uh, and it's not the first time we've been, look, been looking at measurement in relation to training. Uh, there's a very good leaflet uh, which is based on the uh, CPD effectiveness uh, 
uh, submissions. Uh, this one's actually from 2013. All of these numbers uh, uh, make a, a strong link between investment in CPD, revenue growth, pitch conversion rate, uh, savings in recruitment, improvements in margin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this isn't something we're doing uh, from scratch, but we have dug a bit deeper into some of these issues in the research you're about to see. Um, so making the case for talent, I don't suppose I'm going to have to work very hard with this audience to convince you of this point. Uh, but looking back at the Talent Adaptathon, there was some quite interesting stimulus material. So this cartoon was quoted by two separate speakers. Um, oh, it's a good one, that, isn't it? It's like turning up in the same dress. Uh, what if we train them and they leave? What if we don't and they stay? Investing in employees. Um, the, uh, the dilemma that a lot of senior management uh, face. Uh, and you'll see in the numbers that some people are falling uh, maybe on the right side of that uh, um, debate and, and, and some maybe uh, on, on the wrong side. Um, so the uh, Talent Adaptathon was the fifth of the, uh, uh, the, the, the sessions which was organized by an Ian Priest on his presence agenda. Uh, and it's specifically drilling down on issues around attracting, developing, and retaining uh, the right talent and skills. Um, there was about 150 people there, and there were three separate kind of collaborative labs at the end, focusing on future skills gaps, retaining talent, and making the industry more diverse, all topics and themes that have been picked up by speakers this morning. I just want to highlight a couple of the keynote speakers um, who said some quite interesting things about investment in people and the link to commercial success. So Max Bloomberg was one of the keynotes. Uh, he is a research fellow, Goldsmiths, uh, CEO of his own uh, consultancy. And he talked about the link between human capital and generating shareholder value as one of the starting points for the debate. Um, he highlighted that um, human capital is key to agencies but actually less key to individuals, their affinity with uh, those agencies. So organizations are not necessarily as important to talented individuals, which means we have to work harder uh, to keep them interested and motivated. Uh, and investment in training and development could be a differentiator, and he encouraged us to track investment in human capital as a percentage of revenue. So the research you're gonna hear today is a partial response to that, although there's more work that needs to be done. Uh, and then uh, Sydney Hunsdale, who's worked for various different agencies in the um, creative and digital space. Uh, she had some great numbers, uh, and um, particularly focusing on the costs of turnover, of people who get frustrated with the agencies they're working for and decide to go work somewhere else. Uh, so she reckoned it was uh, some, somewhere in the region of 184 million pounds a year was the cost to us as an industry uh, of people uh, deciding to up sticks and leave. Uh, and astonishingly, uh, the cost of replacing senior level staff was 200 to 400% of salary, dropping down through the levels of seniority. Clearly, it's something that if we're not on top of, can create a big hole in our financial performance. Uh, he suggested that reducing churn should be a mandatory management KPI for agencies. Uh, and what if agencies could reduce turnover by reinvesting some of those churn costs in training? Uh, when they're raising questions about where is the money going to come from uh, to invest in uh, uh, training up your people. Um, okay, so let's drill down into the numbers. This is as close as I could get to a kind of growth uh, shop window. Uh, looks um, uh, very enticing, but perhaps a bit too spring-like. Um, so uh, this analysis has been done by the IPA commercial team um, and under uh, Tom's influence. Thanks very much to Roger from the team who was uh, uh, very involved in that. Uh, and the purpose is quite simple. Establish, is there a relationship between agency commitment to staff training and income growth? Um, and the hypothesis, those agencies that show the greatest level of commitment to CPD through external courses and qualifications. So we're only judging here on the basis of investment in IPA training. Uh, not a perfect uh, metric by any means, but it's a reasonable indicator. Uh, do they get uh, experience greater levels of growth than their counterparts? Uh, and because you'll want to know the source of the data and how actually we've worked out the calculations. Uh, we looked at gross income growth between 2010 and 2013. Not everyone reports in the same uh, period, obviously, so we've had to do a little bit of aggregation. Uh, we don't have full numbers yet for 2013 and 14, but they're starting to come in, so we'll update that uh, as we go. Um, and uh, it's based on the number of CPD hours completed over a three-year period. So when you see these numbers here, it isn't one year, it's three years. And likewise, the income groups, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, the growth figures are also based on th 
three years, not one year. Okay? Um, I'll make that point again when we show the graphs. Uh, we've broken it down into small agencies with turnover of less than 5 million. 5 to 15 million is a proxy for medium-sized, and 15 million plus for larger agencies. And it covers the full range of IPA membership. Um, so these are the agencies we looked at, 155 of them across those uh, three categories, clearly biased towards the smaller end, uh, but uh, a, a decent sample size in all three groups. And for each of the groups, I'm going to show you three charts, and there's a summary table at the end, which I won't go through, but if you want to look at the data afterwards, you can. Um, so obviously, that gives you an indication of the people we were talking to um, in terms of the investments that they're making in uh, training. So this is the number of hours over three years that were uh, invested in, um, in IPA training and CPD. Um, and what you see is that, uh, uh, so if you look at the percentage of uh, agencies showing growth of 10% or more over that time period, that's a three-year window, remember, before the clients get too uh, uh, excited about it being double-digit. Um, and uh, what you see there is a, uh, a line that doesn't go quite up in a straight line, but it is showing uh, a significant link between people who are investing more in training and those that are growing the fastest, i.e. moving on into the next uh, category. Um, and uh, if, if you looked at the overall percentage, so just under half were able to hit that figure. So there's some quite interesting data that's got nothing to do with training. It's actually about financial performance of IPA agencies that you might be interested in looking at. Uh, and then if you look at the median level of growth, so if you looked at all of the agencies together, over three years, uh, they were producing a uh, growth of 9.7% in turnover. Oh, sorry, gross income. Uh, and then uh, those are the numbers there for the uh, whole group. But hopefully you've got the overall message that in the smaller agency sector, the ones who are investing more in training are delivering higher levels of growth. If you go into the middle... Uh, group, there's an interesting uh, subplot emerging here, which is this is the bit where people are not large yet, and they, but they moved out of being small. Um, so we talked to 26 agencies here, and you can see that there are uh, quite a large number who are uh, investing a bit less in training, and then some who are investing quite a lot in training. Um, and if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the mix of those who are, uh, how they performed in terms of growth, the ones who are investing more heavily are significantly faster growth companies uh, than those who are investing less. Um, all these numbers are available and the presentation uh, you can look at afterwards if you want to. Uh, you, I found this particularly interesting, which is the ones who are investing less, less actually a lot of the middle-sized agencies are struggling to grow at all. In fact, they start to go backwards. Uh, so they're not busting through into the larger category uh, maybe because they're caught between, you know, some of the dilemmas we've heard about in terms of, but I can't afford to, to invest in my people because I've got, you know, salaries to pay, etc. Uh, and the net result is maybe uh, they're not delivering on their growth objectives. Um, also summarised there, so you can see uh, those investing more than 500 uh, are starting to accelerate away ahead of the competition uh, and move up into the next tier. And then if we move into the um, final category, the larger agencies... So 15 million pounds plus, 32 agencies, a good spread there. Um, and that's the mix of the uh, uh, investments they're making in CPD. The, the base down the bo bottom changes here as you move up through the agency spectrum because you have to put the bar up. And we've also got those growing by more than 15%. So in the first category, it's quite tough to deliver that when you're a startup agency. Um, uh, so here, the line is pretty clear. The more you're investing in training, uh, the better your chances of delivering growth. Uh, and it's an indication of the biggest and most professional agencies taking uh, investment in people very seriously. Um, and uh, that's reflected, uh, again, in the median level of growth figures. Uh, a bit of a dip down the end there. Is there a sort of point of no return or people not busy enough and putting them on training courses? I'm not too sure. Uh, I won't dig too deeply into that. And then uh, the summary figures for that group as well. Uh, which is showing a pretty consistent picture, certainly for smaller and larger agencies, about investment in CPD and training, producing income growth, uh, or gr uh, gross income growth. And the middle tier are split between those who are, uh, do have the confidence to invest and those who don't, and maybe those two groups pulling apart. Um, so in conclusion from the, the, the data, uh, there's a pretty clear correlation. It's not absolute, clearly, uh, and it's focused on revenue growth and income growth, not on... Uh, profit, so that might be a follow-on thing for us to look at. 
Um, this, this kind of issue in the middle tier about not everyone being able to uh, maybe support and justify the training. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that um, if you invest in CPD hours and make a commitment to CPD training, uh, that uh, that's a pretty good indicator that you're working with an agency that is going to grow. So the uh, hypothesis that was put forward by the commercial team um, uh, seems to be not quite fully proven, but certainly um, strong indication there. Uh, it also seems to suggest there is a virtuous circle. So people invest in training in CPD, it produces income growth. That if you reinvest that into more training, you get more income growth, and you get this kind of virtuous circle building over time. Uh, so let's try and bring that to life a little bit uh, with three examples. Uh, thank you very much to Hunter Lodge and to MTM, M2M for, for providing us with uh, data from their CPD uh, submissions, um, CPD gold submissions. Uh, I did also borrow um, some figures from our own agency, rather easy to get my hands on. Uh, and it's just showing you some real life examples of how people are tackling this issue uh, for agencies in different categories. Uh, so smaller integrated, medium sized media and larger creative agency. Um, so I won't go through all of these points, but they are there for your reference. Hunter Lodge is a 20 plus um, uh, man agency based uh, out in Rickmansworth. Uh, and they offer a full range of services, uh, and they work for these kind of clients. Uh, they are probably the agency in the IPA who invests more in IPA training than any other. Uh, and they also make a very big point about linking that to the services that they offer to clients. In fact, they've rebranded around um, a, a first for knowledge as being their brand differentiator. And they've got some amazing figures here in terms of um, so agency staff with more than one year tenure average 200 hours of CPD per annum, eight times the IPA average. Uh, they've won seven uh, CPD gold seven years in a row and platinum for the last two. Uh, and they calculate, because they actually do study this, £16 return on every £1 spent on CPD. So it's a, it's a great example of a smaller agency, can't afford to do their own training, leaning heavily on IPA to provide them with insight to some of the best brains in the industry. Um, and uh, Rob Hunter, some of you may know him, he attends a lot of IPA functions. Uh, and this will be a shout out for the F test uh, and the advanced certificate, which are uh, two qualifications of a particular emphasis on uh, kind of uh, if effectiveness. Um, he uh, makes that a, a sort of watchword of every single engagement they have with clients uh, and then promotes the investment they make in CPD in the new business pitch situation when they're, look they're looking to win new business. So someone who's really working the investment that they're making to produce business and hold on to clients. Uh, M2M, uh, a media agency within uh, the, uh, uh, the Omnicom Media Group. Um, so here's a few background facts and figures uh, related to them. Uh, some of their clients include people like S.A. Lauder, Hewlett Packard, etc. I believe the, someone from S.A. Lauder may be here today, in which case, uh, welcome to you. Um, and they've been CPD Gold in the last couple of years. Uh, and they're using it as uh, a driver to help them deliver, so 30% growth year on year, now up to 120 uh, people. Um, and uh, they are building, a, they built a model which is uh, linked to long-term commitments to people development. So they want to hold on to the people they've got and uh, use that to kind of leverage more growth opportunities uh, with their existing clients. Um, so they look at direct ROI from their investments in CPD, collecting feedback, what learning has been demonstrated, behavioral changes, and specific results you can point to. Uh, and they are monitoring areas like staff retention, client retention, and so on, um, and measurement of all the pass rates on the investments they're making in CPD. Uh, again, backed by the chief exec um, with a specific quote, which is uh, available in IPA literature everywhere, um, in support of the investments they're making there. So in each case, we've got senior management backing the investments. Uh, and then uh, AMV, um, so uh, uh, I'm sure you all know AMV, we are the, the, uh, the largest creative agency in the UK by uh, pretty much every measure I think. Uh, key clients identified up here um, and we are providing a full range of strategic creative and production services known principally as a creative agency. We put a lot of emphasis on awards, uh, particularly around effectiveness uh, and creativity. Um, and we have an uh, ongoing commitment to CPD 
uh, that resulted in a, a platinum award this year. Uh, we also do a lot of work in the kind of CSR category, and yes, that is Colin Fleming over there um, in the Strictly Come Dancing um, uh, final that uh, he appeared in. Um, and some other work. So we look at sort of uh, CSR as being an extension of our uh, training program and our CPD program because it's teaching uh, our staff other things which are uh, maybe a bit more in the life skills category that they can then bring into uh, client engagements. Uh, too much uh, detail to go through here, but um, uh, we combine an investment in IPA courses, particularly around foundation uh, topics. Uh, with our own uh, resources that are available through BBDO and Omnicom, uh, as I'm sure most uh, larger agencies uh, tend to do. Uh, we have 70% of our account directors taking the IPA commercial certificate, 100% of commercial managers receiving negotiation training, specifically relevant to this audience. Uh, and we also work a lot with leading uh, names in the industry to draw on their expertise to blend together uh, with our own. Um, and run our own internal and external mentoring programs. So uh, more information there if you want to uh, look at it on the, the charts. Uh, here's the uh, charming Richard Ascot, uh, providing a, a, also uh, an endorsement of the investment we're making in CPD. Uh, and one of my uh, kind of um, uh, overall conclusions from this is if you get the senior management on board and are vocally supporting investment in people and training, it creates a momentum which is hard to stop. Okay, so a couple of concluding charts, implications for you and for the IPA. Um, so uh, hopefully the data has shown there's a pretty clear link between agencies, commercial success, and the investment they make in people. Um, and uh, also the IPA can play a really important role in that, particularly for smaller agencies, but even for larger ones in terms of delivering things at scale. Um, and if we can track and measure um, the investments we're making in this area, we can potentially create this kind of virtuous circle that some of these agencies are experiencing. Um, I want to put a bit of a challenge out there to you, which sort of turns the usual debate around uh, HR managers and line managers coming to you and saying, I'd like to put this person on a course. Uh, will you sign the check? Now, if these numbers are right, there's a different question that some of you should be asking your people, which is, are we spending enough on training? Because if there is a link, as these, this data suggests, between training uh, and commercial success, um, then uh, you should be looking at benchmark figures for the industry and judging whether or not you are keeping up with your competitors. Because if you're not, the numbers suggest you could start to fall back. Okay, and then on the IPA side, um, well, we feel this is an interesting area to in assess a bit further. Uh, so we've started a process of looking at the link between investment in people uh, and in commercial success. There's probably quite a bit more that can be done, particularly looking at areas like profitability. Um, and uh, uh, obviously the IPA is a good forum for doing that if it's, um, you, uh, agencies feel able to share that data that maybe they wouldn't in a more um, kind of open forum. And then we can aggregate that and start to draw some more um, meaningful conclusions. Uh, we're also keen to get closer collaboration going between the commercial and talent groups. Thanks to Tom for reaching out to us. Uh, and we'll continue to develop that debate over the uh, coming weeks. Uh, and then uh, if you aren't part of the CPD Gold and Platinum Awards program, I would strongly encourage you to talk to Patrick Mills uh, about that because um, uh, this suggests that that might be a key to helping you uh, drive further growth within your agency. Uh, so, in the rush through the doors, having looked at all those wonderful shop windows, um, if you are interested in uh, knowing more about IPA training programs and CPD, Patrick is in the building. He's just uh, here waving his hand behind you. Uh, speak to Tom and he'll route us through, <laughs> you through to Patrick probably, or by all means talk to myself. Uh, and let's go shopping. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>